Dear students, President Draghi, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to welcome you on behalf of the Bertelsmann Foundation, the Jacques Delors Institutes in Berlin and Paris, and the Hertie School of Governance um, to our colloquium on making Europe's economic union work. My name is Henrik Enderlein. I'm the president of the Hertie School of Governance and director of the Jacques Delors Institute in Berlin. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to start with an anecdote that's very important to me. In March or April 2010, so right before the Greek bailout, I received a phone call from Tommaso Padua Schioppa. Tommaso was one of the founding fathers of the Euro, had served as founding member of the ECB executive work board where I had worked for him, and later on was Italian finance minister. And in that spring of 2010, he was president of Notre Europe, the think tank created by Jacques Delors himself in Paris. Tommaso called me and said three things. Number one, this emerging crisis in Europe is much deeper and more dangerous than people currently think, and it has the potential of destroying the single currency. This is spring 2010. The second thing he said was, the outcome of this crisis will be decided in Berlin. And the third thing he said is, I ask myself whether Germany is ready to take the responsibility to keep the euro area stable. This foresight in the spring of 2010, with hindsight, is just impressive. In later conversations throughout the year 2010, Tommaso, or TPS as he's usually called, um, called me, we spoke, and he informed me about Jacques Delors and his own desire to react to the situation by creating a Jacques Delors Institute or an institute working for Europe in Berlin. We spoke throughout the year about that project. On 16th of December of that same year, 2010, we spoke for a long time, I think two hours, and agreed to create the Jacques Delors Institute in Berlin. He ended the conversation saying, I'll talk to Jacques Delors and call you back on Sunday. On Saturday night, 48 hours later, he died from a sudden, totally unforeseen heart attack in Rome. And President Draghi, you and I met for the first time a few weeks later in Brussels at a round table honoring the contributions of Tommaso to the single currency and to Europe. Why do I tell you all of this? First, this story is at the origin of the creation of the Jacques Delors Institute in Berlin, which was established in 2014, and now becomes part of the Hertie School of Governance where you are today. It's a structure that combines a think tank arm and a research arm, and I'm delighted uh, that Pascal Ami, who is here today, will serve as the president of its advisory board. But the second reason, beyond the anecdote, is whether we like it or not, Tommaso Padua Schioppa's main messages from 2010 still remain valid. Berlin is still the focal point in the decisions on the future of the single currency. And many still today ask the question whether Germany is ready to take its responsibilities to keep the euro area stable in the very long run. Looking backwards, Germany clearly has taken its responsibilities during this crisis. The crisis was overcome thanks to a good interaction between this other place in Germany, Frankfurt, and the government in Berlin. And we look at a broadly stable currency framework in Europe today. But is the entire historic project to create a single currency in Europe as successful as it should be? Probably not yet. Last spring, I was part of a group of seven French and German economists who prepared a report about how to reconcile risk sharing and market discipline in the euro area that started with very simple words. The need to improve the euro area financial architecture to make it less vulnerable to crisis and to deliver, deliver long-term prosperity to all of its members remains as strong as ever. In that report, we presented a package of six reforms that we considered crucial to improve the euro area's financial stability, political cohesion, 
and potential for delivering prosperity. And there are many other proposals of this type out there. As many of you know, in our joint work at the Deloitte Institute with the Bertelsmann Foundation, the Bertelsmann Stiftung, we produced another report, um, Repair and Prepare Growth in the Euro After Brexit. Many co-authors are here today. They're on the panel. That's Enrico Letta. We co-coordinated the report. Arte Reus, um, Pascal Lamy, and uh, uh, they will have an occasion to rediscuss what the recommendations of this report were. Ladies and gentlemen, there is one common theme in these and all the other contributions on the future of the euro. And this is a common currency not only requires a common monetary policy, but also a common approach to the conduct of economic policies. It simply requires an economic union. Almost 30 years ago, in the famous Delors report about the creation of EMU, the authors noted, and I quote, the process of achieving monetary union is only conceivable if a high degree of economic convergence is attained. Have we reached this high degree of economic convergence? I doubt it. And so it is time to spend more time on the E in economic and monetary union. We need to talk about economic union. The definition of economic union in the Delors report still reads as it had been written last week, but it was written 30 years ago. Economic union in that report is re re defined through four basic elements, the single market, competition policies, and other measures aimed at strengthening market mechanisms, and three, common regional and structural policies, policies before four, macroeconomic policy coordination, including, and I quote, binding rules for budgetary policies. That's the law report. 30 years ago. In some of these areas, a lot of progress has been made, in others much less. So let us discuss how can we make Europe's economic union work? This is the question of this afternoon. I have two more tasks. One is I invite my friend Enrico Letta, the Dean of the Paris School uh, of International Affairs, former Prime Minister of Italy and President of the Jacques Delors Institute in Paris, um, to say a few welcoming remarks. And my second recommendation to all of you is take your jackets off, uh, take off your ties if you want. Uh, the climate in Berlin is warm. Um, we know Berlin can be very friendly, but it can also turn very cold uh, a bit later this year and during the winter. With these remarks, Enrico, the floor is yours. Why a conference deeply wanted by Jacques Delors and his institutes? Why here in Berlin and why on the Euro? In opening this great, great event and before giving the floor to uh, Mario Draghi and before listening Jacques Delors' message, let me briefly touch upon these three questions. We talk a lot about the Euro. The single currency is at the center of many debates and discussions. However, there is the impression today that unlike last time, the euro may not be at the very core of the next European campaign next spring. It will be probably more on identity, fears, politics, migrations. And yet today, more than ever, after the most terrible moments of the crisis between 8 and 13, we need, we have to complete this project, which is certainly successful, but still needs something more. The euro needs a soul, and it also needs a couple of screwdriver hits. Why a soul? A soul so that our fellow citizens, European voters, Consider it for what it is, a great unifying factor of European values and a way of being altogether stronger in an ever bigger world which is less and less Eurocentric and more and more Asian. Why a screwdriver? Because the euro is a complex tool 
that must work automatically and with clear mechanisms that allow to prevent crisis and act effectively in emergency situations. At the beginning, when the euro was created, it was built mainly for the summer, not for the winter, talking about weather and about this Sicilian weather in Berlin today. Then, when the winter came for the euro and for our economy, it was understood that we still needed the screwdriver. And the screwdriver was indeed used, but perhaps not enough. It is thanks to Mario Draghi, his decisive action and his authentically pro-European vision that today the euro is still alive, alive, united and sufficiently strong to keep pushing ahead the European integration process, which today is faltering. So the soul and the screwdriver, two words that immediately connect to the thought and action of Jacques Delors, who today is unfortunately unable to be physically with us as he would have deeply desired. Pascal Lamy will read immediately after my uh, welcome remarks the uh, intervention of, and the message of Jacques Delors. And at the same time, the two institutes that were born from his initiative and today organize this conference today together with the Bertelsmann Foundation, thank you, Hart, and with the Erti School of Governance. It means the Franco-German couple, because Paris and Berlin, which a few weeks ago discussed in Meseberg about the euro. And it is a couple upon which certainly depends the political impetus for the eurozone. Nevertheless, I'm Italian. I'm very proud to be Italian there. Let me say that I'm sure that Italy will be back soon as protagonist of the European uh, integration. This is to say that it is obvious that the European Union is not just the Franco-German couple, but it is essential to repeat that without this engine, it would be impossible to advance and prepare the euro for the winter. This is why this meeting is taking place here in Berlin. And this is why our two institutes are very much active and protagonists of this historical moment. We are now entering in a year, 19, that in one way or another will change European history. Brexit in March, with the imminent risk of a no deal, and European elections in May, with a probable political earthquake that will change the equilibrium in Strasbourg, which so far has been a quiet equilibrium, oriented towards continuity for 20 years. In short, intense changes are awaiting us. We must therefore resume the reforms of the euro. It is very important, it is fundamental, and it cannot be further delayed. This is why we will listen very carefully to Mario Draghi's words and his vision on these topics. And it is why it is from here, from Berlin, that we call, we call on every European not to miss this incredible chance to finally have a euro fixed by the screwdriver and a euro with a soul. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as uh, already mentioned uh, by Enrico Letta and by uh, Enrique Underline, uh, Jacques Delors, who took the initiative of this uh, conference uh, here in Berlin, had to uh, cancel his trip due to uh, serious health problems. So he's asked me uh, this morning to read the remarks uh, he had uh, prepared, 
which uh, I will now do. President Draghi, uh, Minister Schultz, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I've been uh, greatly looking forward to this conference, and I wanted it to be here in Berlin since the future of the Economic and Monetary Union uh, implies a determined uh, support from Germany. Of course, I would like, like to be here in person to discuss this topic with you, uh, if my health had uh, permitted. Because now uh, is the time to uh, decide, uh, is the time to act, is the time to move forward, as is Zeit. Things are certainly uh, going less badly for Europe. The financial crisis of 08 and its consequences, the so-called uh, Euro crisis, are now behind us. The Union's uh, institutional framework has shown itself to be more robust than the markets or commentators uh, considered it to be. And at the forefront, uh, it was the European Central Bank and its president uh, who uh, played a decisive and uh, crucial role in ensuring uh, that the euro remained resilient. And for this reason, I'm especially pleased and honored that uh, Mario Draghi is taking part in this conference and that he will uh, share with us uh, today his ideas on the future of the Economic and Monetary Union. At a moment when Europe and its fundamental values are under attack from populists of all kinds, at a moment where one of our largest uh, member states has taken the brutal decision to leave us, we cannot content ourselves uh, with contemplating our past successes or merely defending uh, what we've already built. The time has come to be once again uh, audacious, to continue to construct a Europe that is more effective, more balanced, more united. And with this in mind, I thank the Delors Institutes in Paris and Berlin, uh, together with the Hertie School and uh, the Bertelsmann Stiftung, uh, for having uh, jointly organized this conference and for the fact that both institutes have uh, actively engaged with their ideas, with their suggestions in this debate about the future of EMU, offering their unique perspective from uh, both uh, Paris and Berlin. To take the full measure of the work that lies ahead of us, uh, allow me to put the Economic and Monetary Union uh, in a long-term context. Monetary integration in Europe was neither an accident of history nor a purely political project, as uh, some like to say it. It was primarily the logical consequence of having built a single market with its four indivisible freedoms. It was an essential complement of the single market. A single currency is an indispensable element of a single market, the sort of fifth freedom, if you like. And in this sense, uh, the euro is a collective insurance, and I'm convinced that it has helped us all, France, Germany alike, Spain, Finland, uh, to manage the crisis far better than each would have done it uh, left to their own individual fate. But it is also true uh, that uh, for reasons good or bad, uh, the Economic and Monetary Union was created with a lot of emphasis on the M, monetary integration, and not enough on the E, economic uh, convergence and integration. And as soon as we talk about the economic, uh, we cannot separate it from the social. When we created the single market, we set up uh, the structural funds so that the benefits of integrating our markets would be accompanied uh, by instruments capable of making the new single market a promise of prosperity for all. But when we created the single currency, we did not sufficiently develop the tools to ensure 
that the benefits of integrating our currencies would lead to a converging Europe, a Europe socially balanced for all. These are and must be the two pillars of the EMU, the economic and the social, which we must uh, build in the years ahead. And I have always said, and I repeat it today in Berlin, the euro needs both legs to walk. The monetary leg alone is not sufficient and will never be sufficient. And I hope that Europe today has uh, understood uh, this reality. After the UK's historic vote to leave, the Union stands more united, stronger, more determined uh, in a uh, global system, uh, which some uh, are obviously uh, trying to upset. Since the start of the negotiations with London, the 27 have shown uh, tenacious cohesion. In the face of this cohesion, uh, Brexit, which I deplore, uh, both for Europe and for our British friends, provides a clear demonstration that belonging to the European Union uh, brings uh, benefits to all. And that leaving it is a mistake now and for the future, uh, which is probably why no continental leader today is seriously contemplating exiting uh, the European Union. But I also have the impression uh, that with the crisis, uh, attitudes on economic and monetary union have evolved. The recent uh, agreement at uh, Meseberg uh, between the French and the German governments opened the door to a compromise uh, that could be uh, acceptable uh, everywhere in Europe. I salute the German finance minister, Olaf Scholz, uh, for the work he has uh, accomplished with his uh, French counterpart to uh, bring about this compromise. And in my view, it deserves to be taken seriously and it merits a closer look. I think uh, this compromise is appropriate, not because it's the most ambitious one uh, one could uh, imagine. No, it is attractive uh, because it is at once pragmatic and innovative, because it addresses the future of our currency in a way other than solely via the financial markets. The banking union is certainly an essential step forward, probably the most important step forward uh, towards integration uh, on the economic level since Maastricht. But as we know, EMU is far more than a financial uh, framework. Uh, it needs to have the tools uh, to make our economies converge, to ensure European prosperity, uh, which remains uh, our uh, common objective. And I feel that uh, with their proposal uh, for a real budget for the Eurozone, Germany and France have taken uh, an important step toward this objective. And I really do hope uh, that our two countries uh, will pursue this path and will be uh, joined uh, by others. We will not be able to join, uh, to go to the European elections uh, next May, which are approaching, and in which the stakes this time will probably uh, be higher than usual without having made decisive progress along this path of economic and social convergence, uh, which is in line uh, with the expectations of our fellow citizens ever since uh, they've had the euro in their pockets. And I hope that this uh, conference will move us uh, forward. A useful uh, reminder to finish, when the uh, Single Currency Act uh, was adopted, uh, giving birth to the Single European Act, sorry, was adopted, giving birth to the single market, its uh, for freedom, its uh, structural policies. I raised the prospect of a single currency like the trade of a little uh, 
people in the story, Le Petit Poussé, with a vision and confidence. And without tiring, I repeated uh, this uh, symbolic phrase, which I want to leave with you today. Uh, in Europe, it is growth that drives us, it is cohesion that makes us stronger, and it is solidarity that uh, unites us. And I sincerely hope that uh, this formula will uh, define the spirit. A further EMU reforms, it's essential, so that the uh, European Union, uh, finally conscious of itself, can be this uh, creative force of uh, influence, uh, peace, and uh, human uh, progress. So, this is uh, the last text. Uh, I will uh, now uh, ask uh, Mario Draghi, uh, the president of the European Central Bank, uh, to uh, take the floor. After all, he's our main speaker today. Mario, you have the floor. Dear President Letta, dear President Enderlein, dear Minister Scholz, your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear students, let me first say why I'm especially thankful for this invitation at this point in time. Uh, occasions like these are precious for uh, enhancing, obviously, for enhancing consensus about ideas that we share. But they're even more important at times like these that are unfavorable to, pro at least that we perceive now as unfavorable to substantive progress along this line. And uh, an, occasion, an occasion like this is, as I said, precious because it strengthens our determination, the determination of all of us in witnessing our European convictions. And it is precisely through vision, rigorous analysis, and discussion, frank discussion often, that Jacques Delors was able to overcome the economic challenges of his time and what he described as fundamental differences of opinion and mental reservations which characterized the political climate back then. Today, we also face economic challenges and political disputes about the future of European integration. So it's useful to look back at the evolution of European integration in the 80s and see whether we can distill some lessons that can be learned from it. The strategy that Delors, Kohl, Mitran, Andreotti, and other European Union EU leaders developed relied on three elements. First, unlocking the potential of European integration by focusing it on common challenges where the EU could clearly make a difference. Second, Recognizing that integration in one area creates interdependence with other areas. And third, equipping the EU with the tools and institutions to manage that interdependence and ensure, ensure stability and convergence. These three elements, the very same elements, should also guide us today in designing and implementing the necessary reforms of the Economic and Monetary Union. But let's first look at how the situation was way back then. The European economy in the mid-80s was just emerging out of a turbulent decade of recession and weak economic growth. Unemployment in the European community had continually risen from 5.8% in 1980 to 11.2% in 1985. Europe's potential growth rate had dropped from about 5% a year in the 70s to around 2% a year in the following decade. 
The international environment was also becoming less accommodating. America's defense, foreign and economic policy were fastly changing under the leadership of newly elected President Reagan. Trade disputes had emerged across the Atlantic and the share of American imports covered by trade restrictions moved from 8% in 75 to 21% in 84. Trust in forging a deeper European project was low. In the early 80s, just one out of four people, one out of four, expressed any interest in European affairs, and only around half of the Europeans saw their country membership of the EU as a good thing, whatever it meant. The integration process was at standstill, and as the law argued at the time, Europe seemed to lack faith in itself. European leaders of the day understood, however, that low growth was in fact a common challenge and the EU had a powerful tool at its disposal to address it, the common market. They also perceived that any further opening of trade should be accompanied by, me by measures that would ensure its fairness. Intra-EU trade growth had stalled since the early 1970s, in large part because the common market covered mainly intermediate goods, where growth potential was already saturated. Converting the common market into a single market, however, could open up trade in sectors with high R&D and skilled content and reinvigorate productivity spillovers. Establishing a single market meant removing both tariff and non-tariff barriers, such as differences in licensing rules and technical standards, which restricted trade and capital flows across countries. And it meant setting common rules to be enforced by a single competition authority so that all parties in the market would be treated fairly and on the same level playing field. But for the single market to be sustainable over time, opening markets and enforcing rules were not enough. Interdependence with other policy areas had to be taken into account, and the EU had to be equipped with the necessary tools and institutions to ensure stability and convergence. First, for safeguarding the integrity of the single market, neither fixed nor flexible exchange rates were seen as a sustainable option in the long term. Under flexible exchange rates, countries losing market share could engage in competitive devaluations, which would encourage retaliatory actions from other countries and would undermine trust among member states. And, as we saw later, a fixed exchange rate regimes were proven to be vulnerable, as we discovered during the ERM crisis. So, economic and financial integration needed to be accompanied by a commensurate step forward in monetary integration. One market with one money, which culminated in the decision to create the euro and the euro system. Second, it was well understood that opening markets could sometimes penalize local producers as well as creating conglomeration effects where industries would migrate to the most competitive regions. And that could lead to an unequal distribution of the benefits of integration, which needed to be offset by instruments to ensure fairness and convergence. An integral part of the single market was therefore the establishment of mechanisms at the European level to cater for these needs. Stronger, competitive, stronger competition enforcement was matched by stronger protection for local producers, such as extending geographical indication protections for specific foods. And there was also an increase in the size of the EU budget and a major rebalancing of expenditure away from agriculture and towards convergence and cohesion. 
we would call it today a governed globalization. Specifically, targeted funds were provided to promote adjustment in regions that were less developed or suffering from the effects of trade liberalization. By 1992, the budgetary allocation for structural funds rose from 17% of the EU expenditure to more than 25%. Taken as a whole, this was a far-reaching and visionary strategy and one that took tremendous political courage to bring about. And, by and large, it worked. By 1988, two years after the Single European Act was launched, growth in intra-EU trade had already regained its level of the early 70s. And by 1990, the EU potential GDP growth had risen by a percentage point to 3% a year. Thanks to economic integration, estimates suggest that after 10 years of European Union membership, a country's per capita income is on average 10% higher than if it has stayed outside the Union. And this is confirmed by recent data as well. As a result, the single market has become increasingly popular. Free movement of goods, people, and services is now routinely seen by the public as one of the most positive results of the European Union next to peace amongst member states. And this is so even today. The lesson is clear. When Europe focuses on common challenges, when it recognizes interdependence, and when it responds with appropriate institutions, it does succeed. And when integration is not accompanied by fairness, it does not. The areas where the monetary union has underperformed most in recent decades are those areas where that were left unfinished in the 80s and the 90s, such as the framework for fiscal policies and for banking supervision. Jacques Delors himself was deeply concerned that the institutions for fiscal policy coordination were too weak for a monetary union. And others saw early on that a single currency would need a system of common banking supervision. We know that these holes in the framework ultimately contributed to the build-up of imbalances and certainly played a role in the euro era crisis. But it was not the single market and the single currency that produced this situation. It was the failure to follow through in all areas with a formula that had worked in these areas previously. The challenges we face in Europe today are in many ways similar to those of the Lord's era. We are also exiting a deep recession that has left lasting scars on the economy and society. The international environment is characterized by rising uncertainty, and some are questioning whether European integration remains the answer to our common problems. Potential growth has been slowing down with respect to other advanced economies, and it is projected to remain weak for some time. And just as in the 80s, many in the 1980s. Many of our challenges have this weak growth performance at their root. Low growth exacerbates pressures on public finances. It does aggravate joblessness, especially among the young and the unskilled. It heightens distributional questions about open markets. And it creates a false perception among the public that protectionism may be a solution. So, can Europe again provide the keys to change our growth trajectory? Of course, the answer I give is yes. But only if we transfer in full the strategy that has worked in the past. That is, a clear focus on the areas where Europe can add value and a rigorous attention to consistency across policies. The most important area where Europe can contribute positively to growth remains the single market. 
most euro area countries have aging societies, which means that raising living standards and increasingly depend, will increasingly depend on higher productivity growth. This, however, productivity growth, however, has been stalling in the euro area for some long time. The single market represents one of the most powerful tools we have to unlock the mechanisms that will raise productivity. Productivity growth takes place through two channels, innovation and diffusion of new technologies. We have innovative firms in Europe and they compare well with their international peers. But innovations do not diffuse quickly enough to other firms which of course has negative consequences on productivity in the wider economy. Just think, the top 10% of firms are on average three times more productive than the firms in the bottom 10%. And the sector where the gap is the widest is services. In this context, advancing the single market agenda can help in two ways. First, Research shows that openness to trade is a key factor in enabling faster technology diffusion. Completing the single market in services can therefore boost productivity by raising trade in services, which should be higher in a fully integrated market. Services make up over 70% of the GDP of the European Union, but only 20% of services are traded across borders and this represents just 5% of the product. The second element is building a true single market in capital. Deep financial markets play a critical role in facilitating diffusion by providing the risk capital for firms to commercialize new technologies. But the opportunities for, of our large financial markets are, no, are not being exploited. In the Euro area, only 30% of debt securities and 20% of equities are held by investors in other countries, and only around 10% of the assets of the banking sector are held by branches and subsidiaries of cross-border banks. So completing the banking union and capital markets union are the critical ways to improve over this situation. Taken together, the gains from this agenda would be sizable. According to one estimate, removing all barriers to trade could raise the EU income by up to 14% over 10 years and double intra-EU trade. This underscores why, especially for countries struggling with low productivity, this is a quite important message, countries with low productivity shouldn't think about reversing the direction of European integration because this is simply not a profitable path. Moreover, in an international environment where trade openness can no longer be taken for granted, so don't think you'll find a bigger market elsewhere. A broad and deep internal market may be even more important to shield these countries and all of us from external shocks. But completing the single market financial markets help share through exchange rate devaluation. This takes place through this risk sharing takes place through two main channels. The first is an integrated capital market. Typically, a recession causes both consumption and asset prices in a region to fall, which then reinforces the downturn. But when people can diversify from regions, they can smooth their consumption by drawing on the assets they hold in the better performing part of the union. The second channel is an integrated banking sector. Because local banks are typically heavily exposed to the local economy, a downturn will lead to large losses and prompt them to cut lending to all sectors. But if they operate in several countries, if there is what we call cross-border banking, they can offset losses in one part of the union with gains in other regions 
and therefore they can continue to provide credit even to the parts of the Union where there has been a recession, which is exactly what not happened, didn't happen during the crisis. In the United States, it's estimated that around 70% of local shocks are absorbed through integrated financial markets. In the euro area, only 25% of shocks are absorbed in this way because our financial integration is lower. As I've explained elsewhere, this is one reason why our crisis was so protracted and why some countries diverged economically so much, as we've seen. Risk sharing, in other words, fosters both stability and convergence within monetary unions. And without that, it becomes much harder to make high rates of growth sustainable. So to boost growth and increase private risk sharing, our priority should be to reestablish a clear focus on finishing the single market and to be consistent with the strategy that Jacques Delors laid out to buttress this progress on the single market with the appropriate tools and institutions. And today, this applies most of all to closing the gaps that remain in the institutional architecture of the monetary union. And there are two key areas where action is needed. We've already taken important strides in the directions of deeper financial integration with the creation of the European Banking Supervision, a harmonized rule book, and a single resolution mechanism. There's also been considerable risk reduction in the banking sector. Bank capital is today higher, much higher. Leverage has gone down. And non-performing loans are gradually being reduced. There's was progress there, no question. But there's still work to do. And this includes finishing up, first of all, finishing with clean up of bank balance sheets, since legacy assets are a powerful deterrent to cross-border takeovers. And um, we have especially one thing to do. We've got to remove the remaining supervisory and regulatory barriers that hamper cross-border activity. For example, despite the banking union, regulation still limits the free flow of capital and liquidity within cross-border banks. This reduces the gains, the efficiency gains for the banks that the banks might have in operating on a European scale and keeps retail banking mostly domestic. Yet leveling the playing field alone is not sufficient. This is the second point. Today, debate is often cast in terms of dichotomies, private risk sharing versus public risk sharing, and risk sharing versus risk reduction. I believe that, to a great extent, these different goals are complements, not substitutes. Take, let me give you a few examples. First of all, take the example of restrictions on the free flow of liquidity and capital. These barriers exist in part because there is an incomplete framework for bank resolution in the euro area with no public backstop. If there is a residual risk that the costs of bank resolution will end up on one single government's balance sheet, those national authorities of this government will have the incentive to limit capital and liquidity flows so that they can, they can better protect their depositors in the events of a failure. But with the common public risk sharing through a backstop for the resolution fund, the incentives to limit at national level capital and liquidity flows would disappear. That would in turn lead to greater banking integration and private risk sharing at euro area level. Risk sharing, however, would not be a way to avoid risk reduction when markets have confidence that banks can be resolved efficiently, it stabilizes the system and reduces the cost of crisis. In other words, risk sharing actually reduces risk. Let me give an example of this. This is the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation in the United States, which is also the resolution authority and is backstopped by a credit line with the U.S. Treasury. 
During the crisis, it resolved without much of a problem, certainly without any financial instability, it did resolve about 500 banks, and this without, as I said, triggering financial instability. And this was possible because of the confidence that the resolution framework was effective, and that was backed by the resources it needed to do the job. Resources, by the way, which were not used on that occasion. On the other hand, in the European Union, during the crisis, the banks that had been resolved, I guess they are in the, in the order of 10, 10, a factor of 10 less, about 50 banks were resolved. So basically we missed a great opportunity to reduce risk in our banking system, which now remains overcrowded. So the same sort of interaction does apply to fiscal policies. We saw during the crisis that lack of fiscal space needed to stabilize economies can create a vicious circle of low growth, rising bond spreads, and loan losses in the banking sector. And that, of course, produces a credit crunch and a financial fragmentation. So for as long as this risk exists, it's obvious that it will deter deep financial integration. It also means that private risk sharing tends to collapse at precisely the moment it is most needed. To address this, the first priority is to make national fiscal policies more effective by encouraging governments to build up buffers. For that, we need to rekindle faith in our fiscal rules by making them both more counter-cyclical but also more binding. But we know that even sound domestic policies are not always enough. Markets can at times overreact and penalize sovereigns over and above what may be needed to restore a sustainable fiscal path. And this overshooting can harm growth and ultimately worsen fiscal sustainability. And this is why there is also a role for public risk sharing. Although the more we complete the banking union and the capital markets union, so the more we make private risk sharing bigger and more efficient, the smaller is the need for public risk sharing. The European stability mechanism cannot fully fill this gap, as it typically leads to pro-cyclical fiscal tightening. So we need an additional fiscal instrument to provide stabilization. There ought to be an instrument that complements monetary policy in delivering macroeconomic stability, both at the euro area level and, crucially, in each of the member states. As I've discussed elsewhere, what shape this fiscal instrument should take is still open for discussion. But any proposal should fulfill the, at least the following two conditions. First, it should be adequate to its task, which is restoring full fiscal stabilization capacity. As I said, its size, in a sense, depends on how well we proceed on the private risk sharing front. And second, it should be properly designed so as to contain moral hazard. With these conditions in place, such an instrument should be seen as a way of reducing risk rather than increasing it. Let me now conclude. This is a difficult time, and difficult times teach lessons. I think that rather than criticizing our opponents' views or offering simple solutions to complex questions that are almost invariably wrong, let's try to understand what these lessons are. And the example of the Founding Fathers our Monetary Union is an invaluable help in this search. First, we should not be discouraged that there is still work to do to complete our union. No union is built perfectly from day one. It's an evolutionary process that is well described by the commitment to build a more perfect union between quotes as it is enshrined in the United States Constitution. 
History suggests, and that's the second lesson, that this evolution tends to follow people's priorities. In the 80s, the overriding goal was to shake off what was called the Eurosclerosis that stalked Europe at the time and growth became the top priority. Today's priorities include personal and economic security, addressing youth unemployment, strengthening social models so as to care better for the sick, the old, and the unemployed. But how will these objectives be achieved? Today, like 30 years ago, the answer lies in the restoration of growth and in the respect of our common European values. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Draghi. Thank you, Henrik. Thank you, Henrik Oletta. My name is Katharina Gnad, and I have the pleasure to moderate the panel discussion this afternoon. I think we have quite a big task, given that our previous speakers gave us a lot of food for thought to chew on. But we also have an excellent panel to do that. Pascal Ami, you've met him already, worked very closely with Jacques Delors at a crucial phase when the euro was introduced. He then became EU Trade Commissioner and Secretary General at the WTO, an organization where the EU already speaks with one voice. So Pascal Lamy is, has extremely detailed knowledge of the ins and outs of EU policymaking. Elga Bart is with us today, and I'm very happy that you're here because you bring to this discussion a, a great deal of macro uh, research experience, and you also bring an outside perspective, which is very important. Elga Bart is Managing Director and Head of Market and Economics Research at the BlackRock Investment Institute in London. The Institute provides research and analysis for the largest independent wealth asset management company. So if you're looking for a big economic market player, both in the Eurozone but also more globally, here you are. And last but not least, I have the distinct honor to welcome Vice Chancellor and Finance Minister Olaf Scholz. We are very happy that you found the time to talk to us today. Many eyes across Europe have been on Berlin in the past months and especially on the government. And many of us, including myself, have been asking ourselves, is the new coalition that has been in place for the past six months, is it continuing on the same path um, when it comes to the future of Europe, or is, is there something new? Is there a new way or a new departure? And the coalition agreement certainly raised expectations. So I'm extremely happy that you're here today. We will have the possibility to ask, you, have, you will have the possibility in the audience to ask questions in the second part of the discussion. So you may want to start thinking about good questions already. And without further ado, we'll start straight away into the discussion. We heard many construction sites and many areas where we need work, and we heard a lot of proposals already from President Draghi, but I want to start a little bit differently today. Let's take a step back and ask ourselves, what happens if we don't make Europe's economic union work? So, Minister, what is your most, what is your strongest worry that will happen if we don't get our act together? I'm very much um, aligned with uh, President Macron saying that uh, it's all about the European sovereignty. This is an economic question, this is a political question, and it's also a question which is uh, important discussing about financial union and banking union. And I'm absolutely sure that if we do not succeed with the necessary progress in Europe, we will have a lot of problems in our own countries and we will not be able to solve them. Just in the situation we are in, 
anyone understands more easily what may, might have been very difficult for a very long time to explain. Looking at trade policy, no single country would be that fine as we are now debating with the American president about trade questions if we would not be together. And it was something like a very good experience when we are at G7, G20 in Washington discussing with the ministers, the vice president, the president and so on, saying that on trade questions it is the European Union to deal with. And that this is the same when we discuss about currency questions. We see that there is a lot of problems coming up and no single country would have the strength to have an independent strategy on its own currency and the development of its own economy if we would not stick together. So our intellectual and political approach must be that we find out the necessary steps to conclude what is necessary to succeed with the, the European Union and that we are able to face the problems to come up. Uh, we heard a lot about the development uh, of the European Union and the banking union, the financial union, the problems of the crisis about growth. And I think that we have some time now to do the next steps because we do not know when the next crisis will come. But it would be a big pity if we would not have established all the instruments necessary when it happens. And so I'm absolutely sure that we do not have time and it would be a great progress if we would succeed this year with most of the important steps, next steps for the banking union and to agree about the, the ones that have to come afterwards. And uh, this would make us more safe. And uh, part of that is that we not just discuss about banking union and financial union and all the necessary steps to look at the banks to make our system more secure. I think it's also that we have to understand what is the macroeconomic uh, decisions that we have to take that we are able to face a crisis with instruments and activities which could be done by the European Union and by the member states together. And there is some questions now on the table. I'm very happy that in many debates and many nights together with my colleague from France, Bruno Le Maire, and uh, together with the two governments of Germany and France in Mesebeck, we made some important progress and this gives us the chance that we could have something which is uh, discussing about what could be a fiscal capacity within the framework of the European Union on what for instance could be the use of something like uh, a back insurance uh, a backstop for the insurance of, uh, of the unemployment schemes and uh, a reassurance and I think this all is the things to discuss now, and I see that there is some progress going on. Thank you very much. You pressed a lot of buttons already, and we will try and dissect these debates a little bit later on. Uh, just to sort of uh, understand, so your long-term worry is really a much more global outlook in the sense of if we don't become European sovereign as a European Union, then we will fail internationally. And in the short run, I took that you're very much working and worrying about banking union. We will come back to that. I now want to um, move on to uh, Elga Bart. You've been observing the Eurozone economy very, very closely. You analyze it for your clients. How would we notice that we don't make it work? What would be the signs of failure that you are looking out for? There are a number of factors that you can look out for. One, obviously, is the growth performance, um, broadly defined. Um, I would also look at the labor market uh, performance in particular, and I do think the fact that we are now having a recovery, that uh, we are sort of regaining some fiscal uh, space, some room for maneuver, and that we see unemployment falling, is offering us an opportunity to push on with more reforms, which tends to be easier, at least in the economic textbooks, in good times. It turns out that in the political practice, it's often easier in the crisis because then there seem, doesn't seem to be an alternative. So one is just the macroeconomic performance. That would be one uh, factor. The second one is, I think, um, economic and social cohesion. Um, we see a rise in political discontent that is not unique to the euro area or to Europe. 
Um, but it is challenging, and I think it's a particular challenge for Europe, or uh, the Monetary Union in particular, um, because Monetary Union needs additional reforms to um, make sure um, that we weather uh, the next crisis well. Um, and that those reforms, uh, both at the national and at the union level, um, require um, the support from the electorate. Um, so I think that's a unique uh, reason to be even more worried about political discontent here in the euro area than elsewhere. So, so you mentioned... So you mentioned p um, political and economic reforms. That is something that you're really looking at when you want to assess whether um, Europe and the Eurozone is doing well or not. You also mentioned social and economic cohesion. Could you give us concrete examples? How would you, what would you look out for specifically? Well, I think one um, result that is quite obvious at the moment is political fragmentation. Um, that we see uh, in uh, many uh, different national parliaments, which we pro potentially will see even more, largely due to the electoral rules in the European Parliament after the next election. Um, so that would be sort of when one very tangible result. Uh, and I think it is, in particular in Europe, to some extent, and even within international, in, in individual countries, look at East Germany, look at the Italian Mezzogiorno, um, regions that are receiving um, a good chunk of transfer payments uh, typically also have a very high degree of uh, political discontent, which means that uh, we actually don't do a good enough job in reviving these areas through economic and, I'm, I would say, supply-side reforms. Mm -hmm. Pascal Lamy. You've heard Minister Scholz and you heard Elga Bart. Do you agree with the assessment of the main worries or is there another thing that is your worst case scenario? No, I, I agree with them. But I would push uh, what they have said a bit further in terms of what should we do. In my view, we have a huge problem and we have to try and solve it in... Uh, a more political approach to the economic and monetary union. I think in this room we probably 90% of us will agree that we need to strengthen the Eurozone. Whatever that means, we recognize it's not strong enough. But let's face it, people don't care. People care about emotional issues, they care about immigration, they care about security. They link immigration and security to a political debate about Europe. Of course, they care about their job or their income, but they do not link their job or their income to whether the Eurozone is working well or less well. And this is a big problem we have. And I think we all, I mean, lots of us are good technicians and we love uh, discussing about the details of the insurance deposit scheme or whether it should be risk sharing or, or, or restructuring. Or, that's very interesting. But at the end of the day, we have to speak to the people. And I think the, the way to do it about Europe, about the euro, is to make the case that it still is a fragile construct. If we don't strengthen it, we will have problems. We, it's not you know, this old story that euro is good because it protects. I think we have to appeal to people's feeling in convincing them that they have to protect the euro. So you would say your main worry is that we're not winning the political debate, depend, uh, no, independent of the economic fundamentals. I think we're not winning this debate in terms of priorities, and it is a priority. So we have to raise this issue higher than it is presently. And by the way, uh, I think this is true both in Paris and in Berlin. Okay, thank you very much. You saw in the first round, and I started with this worst case scenario, people normally don't like to talk about this, but I started with it to show 
what the different problems are on the table. And we heard quite a few of them already in the, uh, from the previous speakers. So we heard economic and structural weaknesses that might be exacerbated, macroeconomic performance and low growth. We also heard very strongly from you, Ms. Bach, um, the worry that there will be less economic and social cohesion or divergence uh, and a lack of solidarity and fairness, as it was put beforehand. But you, Minister, also mentioned the question whether it's not clear whether we are prepared for a new crisis and we need to stabilize our system and introduce stability both in our private but also in our public finances. Uh, and in the end, we talked very globally about the political uh, debate that sort of is around all of these questions. So while we might disagree on the priorities, uh, we seem to be very much online on this panel that something has to be done and the whole conference is on this theme. So not doing anything doesn't seem to be an option. So when we now look at some of the remedies or potential solutions, um, several have been mentioned already and uh, Henrik mentioned that there are many proposals out there, many proposals on the table. I would say the table has to be actually very big to fit all these proposals that have been uh, in the debate for the past well, for the past decades, but more importantly, in the past 24 months. Um, and so when we talk now about specific remedies, I would encourage you to be as concrete as possible um, so that we can get an understanding what you actually mean. And if it's possible, relate, um, related to a problem or a task, uh, President Draghi said, there are lots of different initiatives out there and sometimes we're just not so sure what they're supposed to solve. So when we look at these remedies um, now in turn, let's have a look at what specifically they're supposed to solve. I would like to start with you, Ms. Baj. Um, you mentioned the weaknesses, macroeconomic weaknesses that you observe and you mentioned cohesion issues. What is the most obvious construction side and what would you recommend policymakers to do about it? Yes, yeah, so I think the most powerful lever that we have and that we are not pushing aggressively enough is the single market. Um, if we want to address the main sort of challenges that lie in front of us, uh, which is the technological disruption of the digital age and um, the uh, fight against climate change, I think um, really creating a true single market is by far the most powerful tool because especially if you look at digital um, technologies they are very much driven by network effects so market size of your home market is very very important um, so but it's not just the market size for goods and services or energy or digital uh, services but it's also how uh, we organize our financial system. And President Draghi has already mentioned capital market union. Remember that in the late 1990s, we were wondering on whether Europe would be able to replicate the product productivity miracles that we saw happening with the new economy in the US. Um, we learned back then that one of the elements that was holding Europe back was that young startup companies, which were there, couldn't grow fast enough um, because they lacked access to funding, especially equity funding. So I do think that the capital market union is not just important for risk sharing and financial stability, but it's also absolutely essential for the efficient allocation of capital in, in the sense of physical capital and for the financing of investments into the future. So that would be what I would press the hardest. So you would, you would ask policymakers to take a step back and go back to the fundamentals of the single market. And you mentioned capital market union in particular and the market for finance. You also mentioned the question of innovation and disruption. Do you have concrete examples what you would be looking for? What are you... Um, so the... If you look at all the research that has been done on um, sort of how you create digital leaders, a first mover advantage that you move first and you are the built the fastest growing network gives you a comparative advantage, comp competitive advantage that subsequent followers in those technologies will, very, will find very, very difficult to overcome. And I think we need to bear that in mind. And 
In that context, I don't think we make aggressive enough use of the uh, size of the single market that we could potentially tap into. Um, and that has to do with uh, the whole range of uh, barriers that you have, especially in services, um, still today. Do you have any specific rules or new institutions in mind that you would need for that? Or are we fine with the setup as we are? I don't think we are fine as at the moment, um, but um, so it sort of, um, so there needs to be uh, more um, cross-border competition and you need the access to financing. Okay. Pascal Lamy, you follow the French proposals very closely and you follow the German reactions. So if you had to advise the German government, what is the one number one issue you would advise the German government to concentrate on right now? That's a tough question. Uh, Hypothetically. Uh, I'm, oh, uh, my answer to you is back to politics. The Germans have to explain to the French a number of things which the French do not understand and okay. the other way around. Such as? Such as, for instance, instead of talking about uh, backstop or debt restructuring or debt forgiveness or a budget, why do the Germans hate debt the way they do it? And what, why do the French love solidarity uh, the way they do it? I would, I would dream of Minister Scholz and Bruno Le Maire going to the TV Arte to start with, which is fairly limited. We are on live stream right now. Okay, so. but I mean, Minister Scholz should explain to the French what the Germans have in mind and the other way around. I'm absolutely sure that if the understanding of why the Germans have these attitudes and why the French, if the understanding of that was more shared by public opinions, a lot of resistances would disappear. I'm not saying it's going to be done overnight, but these cultural, uh, anthropological, sort of ideological preferences matter a lot. And if the French are told the Germans are the Germans and they won't agree, and the Germans are told the French are the French and they won't agree, this doesn't lead anywhere. We have to understand why is it so, and then by understanding why because of uh, the German history, because of the philosophy, because of the legions of the past about the North and forest and why the French, these things need to come to the fore of a political debate. I, I'm not going to transform ministers into anthropologists. I know that <laughs> probably would be a, but I think they have to go somewhere in this direction for the other side. Minister Schultz, what do you make of this advice? Is, is this something you can work with or is something else higher on your list of priorities? We already did, but not on TV. So we had some nights together here in uh, Villa Borsig in uh, Berlin and in a very nice house in uh, Paris. And this was the reason why we were able to produce a common paper between the two ministers of finance, which no one expected, at, but it was work of 30 or 40 hours so, and concrete talks. So there is a need for talking and there is a need for finding agreements. And uh, being, being a German and very much used to the federal system of my country, I know that when we want to have success in Europe, we have to understand the federal structure of this European Union. So I want to uh, convince anybody then that we will have a way to, 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 to do the necessary things when the United Kingdom will have left the European Union, because this will be a very difficult and delicate situation with this big country in the center of Europe with the big size of its economy and it is necessary that we don't understand ourselves as those who give the direction but taking the responsibility of being the one of this size to have a good cooperation with France and to have a way of always discussing with all the other 26 members of the then European Union so that anyone understands that he has a voice and that we find a way to put things together, which is a 
important and difficult approach, but I think it is necessary that we follow this line. Let me just come back to what uh, Pascal said in the beginning, because I would like to underline that he is absolutely right when he says, I would say the European Union and not the European market or so, but that the European Union needs a more political approach. My view is that we are at a point where it is a mistake just to continue the debates about single markets. Because what you said, for instance, is absolutely true, and I would under subscribe any word you said, but the political debate must be understood, and it is about different questions when we discuss about the future and the need of the European Union, and this is about foreign policy, this is about defense, this is about our common borders, this is about uh, refugees' migration, this is about the question of how we can build up champions, then we come together to the points you have there, and this is the question of uh, a way of social cohesion to have minimum regulations which are similar to all the different countries and how we deal with the questions of climate change. So there is a lot of politics. And our big problem is that the European Union started as uh, building a market. And even some of the progress was, uh, was uh, based on the idea of having a better market because this was the only way for the European Commission or someone else to get the next progress, but it was in many cases really a political reason for doing these steps. And now we should learn that if we do not un understand that the next step must be that we argue in politics about politics and not from a market perspective, we will not be able to solve the market questions. And this is why both things are together and why we have to understand this. I think as we have different cultures in Germany with 16 states about uh, responsibility on debt. We know the differences. From outside we are all the one, but uh, it's different. We will have different cultures of uh, dealing with debt in Europe, though we have a common framework anyone should follow. But we must be able to discuss from the perspective of a working European Union and the working European market and financial market and banking union, what would be necessary to succeed? And then we can discuss how this fits to the national strategies and policies. If someone puts into this debate about the needs of what the European Central Bank, for instance, should be able to do, looking at national, national strategies and what will be the next in your own country, it would be a mistake. We have to learn that we must be able to understand intellectually what is the needs if we are looking from that perspective. And yes, we always look what will be the outcomes for us, but the first view must be the European and it must be intellectually the right one that the things are working when things have to be done. And, but I very much agree to what Pascal said. If we do not learn that it is about politics, the people will be frustrated even in the future about what is going on because they don't understand the things and they have good reason for doing so. And then we will be not able to address them because all these political strategies about making America great again, first take back control and things like that, they are always giving the idea that there is only the national country, the, the national area where you have a chance to influence the world development and the technical development and the future of yourself and your people. But we have to learn that this is not the truth. The truth is that we, if we want to intervene in the way the world is running, we need to be together. And so most of the skepticism about Europe is not because it's too strong. This is what they say. It is that it is too weak to solve the problems and that it is not addressing the problems. So we have to understand the political uh, surroundings of what we do. I'll take you up on the politics point in a second, but Pascal, I mean, you wanted to um, intervene straight away? or no, just, just to give uh, one concrete example. People do not understand the 
complexities of why convergence, how we can work, again, what is a fiscal backstop. There's one thing they understand about economics, which is tax. Now, that's an area where Europe is totally disunited. If I go and in the street and I talk about an economic union, people will say, we're all competing with taxes. And this is something they understand because they pay taxes. But so far, this has been less totally outside of the debate, usually because economic ministers are dealing with economy and uh, budget ministers are dealing with taxes. So for this reason, this is not at all in the political discussion. Let's put this into the political discussion. This is an element of economic and monetary union which people understand. I, I want to bring in the taxes. You, you were faster than I was. But I want, to, I want to come back to one point and dig a little bit deeper now in some of the um, policy proposals that are on the table. If I understand you correctly now, you say we need to come out of the tech technocratic chambers and we need to, at the European level, really do politics. And that means to me... Um, that it means to say who benefits, what is the interest, and possibly also who loses, and then have a, f a robust discussion on this. So you said that you wanted to strengthen instruments for economic convergence. And one proposal that you've made um, in the early summer, and that also found its way into the Miseberg Declaration, is the question of a, um, unemployment reinsurance. So... Would you be able to tell me in a very political way um, who benefits, who loses, and what are your ideas on this? First, it's dealing with the fact that we have and that we will have completely different systems of unemployment schemes in all the member states. And what we, in our very proper circumstances, always underestimate is that uh, there is a lot of countries who don't have a support for the long-term unemployed still, which I think is an economic problem because if uh, you don't have a long-term support for long-term unemployed, the only way to get through your life is to have a good family, a good neighbor or someone you know in the bureaucracy, and then all the things happen which are bad for economic development as well. So a very good working social welfare system in the single country is a good basis for a proper economic development. And I'm absolutely sure that the way we have it, not in any detail, but in the, in the basic elements, is one of the reasons of the economic success of Germany. So I think starting the debate that we need something is also saying that anywhere there should be some way of support for the long-term long unemployed and then we need a reassurance, and my idea is to look very much to the American way they did it. They have something like that, and it could be a role model for having um, a system where the different uh, countries combine their activities. It is not a transfer, but it is producing the ability that you are not enforced to do pro-cyclical policies, which we do in many countries and even Germany sometimes do. So raising the contributions, for instance, if this is the system, to the uh, support for unemployed or to the social welfare system in a crisis, but we are now discussing about unemployed, is a mistake. But this is what's happening at many places. Decreasing the support of the unemployed in a crisis is a mistake as well. So in many cases, due to financial restrictions, we see that in a cyclical crisis in a certain country, they do absolutely the wrong things because they don't have the means to help them through this situation. And this is why I think that a collective system of a reassurance, not a transfer, in Europe could help a single country which faces a crisis of two or three years to get through it. It will not help the situation to work with uh, long-term unemployed, with diff economic difficulties of the country which are structural. This is something which will be, in the end, always uh, be handled by national strategies, more or less. But the cyclical crisis must be faced by European policies. I challenge you on the politics. Who will finance that model? To be discussed, uh, there is this American model, which is, uh, I think, uh, something that could be 
a role model for that. But uh, if you look at the different systems, and the Americans are not that different, uh, possibly we'll find a different way for doing it. So it is something that should be part of finding the solution. The main, I think the biggest step is done when we accept the idea of reassurance and not of a common system of unemployment uh, support, because this will never work in a world where the minimum wage in the one country is 130 and the other is, uh, is, uh, is if you count together all the money one earns in one month, uh, 1,500 or 600 euros, then you cannot have a, a common system of working. You just can work with a reassurance scheme. Thank you very much. Uh, Pascal Lamy, the French proposal on a Eurozone budget seems to have similar functions sometimes. It's also about absorbing shops, uh, shocks, helping countries in crisis. So would you say that Mr. Scholz's proposal could be an equivalent to a Eurozone budget, or is that something different and you would do different things with it? It's uh, ideologically, a budget is very different from uh, an insurance scheme. We know the French like expenditure, uh, and the <laughs> Germans uh, don't like expenditure, uh, neither private nor public. So we, we know that. And we know, and we know that there is, between the two ministers, there's an agreement at looking at some sort of European unemployment scheme. You've heard what Mr. Schultz just said. This is not about transfers. Now, that's, that's the coin of the German position. Why? Because German public opinion doesn't like transfers. Small problem being that the French public opinion loves transfers. In their direction. Oh. So we have, to, we have to reconcile. A, we have to acknowledge that our collective preferences are different. B, that we want to agree. And the two things are as important. And three, we, found, we have to find a way that combines this notion that it has to be about the reinsurance, but that uh, this reinsurance, at the end of the day, there's, this is backed somewhere by an institution and by a place where, in case, there should be money. And I think the fact that between uh, Minister Schultz and Minister Le Maire, they've agreed that if there has to be a Eurozone budget, the size of which is still uh, to be discussed, it is within the euro budget is a big step forward because it gives the insurance to the French that that's not going to be a small ship that's going to float elsewhere from the big armada and get lost at the first uh, tempest. It's within the European Union system and I think giving this reinsurance is very clever. So just to say that there are areas where after a long consultation, although minds will be different, this is something that can move forward. Thank you very much. So we talked about the politics of naming this and what it entails. Ms. Batch, from a market perspective, no matter whether it's a Eurozone budget or a, an unemployment reinsurance, do you think it would help stabilize the economy or are policymakers wasting their time right now and they should be focusing on something else if they want to if this is the goal i think it helps at the margin but if you look at all the um, sort of studies that are done about how you buffer asymmetric shocks in other um, entities whether it's the united states canada or in fact here in germany between the regions you will see that by far the largest part of the shock absorption between different regions, parts of the country, doesn't come through 
shared tax revenues, a common unemployment system. It comes through um, cross-border or cross-regional investments. And that is what brings me back to the Capital Markets Union. Um, we need more of that, and we need to move away from a system that is first and foremost bank-based and debt-based and move towards one that is more equity-based, because equity in cross-border investments give you also the upside. If stuff goes well somewhere else, you enjoy that too. Uh, and if you, your region, let's say, comes under pressure, the adjustment is continuous mm -hmm. and not sort of um, binary as it is for debt. So I do think that this needs to be also looked at um, because that empirically in existing um, federal states is a very important mechanism of stabilization. Um, and just to come back on the single market, I do, and maybe it's because I'm an economist, I feel a huge attachment, emotional attachment to the single market. I think it's amazing that you can order Italian olive oil, um, you know, French fashion um, or cheese and uh, German bread living at the moment in London and it sort of arrives at your doorsteps without any problems uh, in terms of, you know, taxes, tariffs and so on. So uh, I actually think that we... Sorry? of labor and, and, and scientists. True, but, but to me, even, you know, if you drive a car in a border region of Europe and you suddenly look up and you just see from the fact that um, the, the signposts now have a different font or a different color that you actually must have crossed the border. I think that's amazing. And maybe we are not working this angle as a political achievement, as emotional connection uh, enough, but uh, yeah, I feel a, a, an enormous attachment <laughs> to the single market and all the. Uh, so was, uh, the law was wrong. <laughs> the law was wrong when he said that you don't fall in love with a single market. At least, in yeah, Mrs. But I would, Mrs. I would like to, to to say one at something. One question. Um, We will not succeed with uh, getting some progress in the single market if we do not succeed with democratic in decisions. Because the problems to be solved are not uh, building a market by deregulation, which usually is the approach if you get progress, if just building the market is the aim to follow. And then you uh, lose the support of the people. Because they, it is, this is something the European Union and all the Europeans, and I'm one of them, have to ask themselves. Why could it happen that the British thought globalization is the European Union, though the real answer would have been to fight against the problems of globalization, you need something strong as the European Union. And this comes from the way of integration we had so far due to political reasons and the founding procedures and all this. And it is built about the single market. So the principles of a globalized world were the measures of integration within Europe. But if you want to have the idea that founding and building Europe is something which gives you a political approach to deal with the new questions of globalization, you need a democratic answer. And to give you an example, there is a lot of debate about the question, but the new data regulation by the European Union is a democratic approach and is forming a single market for data and economies related to that. So it was necessary for having integration in Europe and protecting the people. And we have to learn if this is not exactly the same we already had in Germany, it is not the bigger problem. The bigger problem would be if there is arbitrage about deregulation between the member states to get a small bit of uh, a market which could be much bigger if we have a common regulation. I see a theme emerging here, and that is one of politics, politicizing, and now you mentioned the term democracy. So, I wanted to ask the question later, but uh, you gave the best uh, advance on this. Do you think the European Union and the Eurozone in particular, if we now really want to see more politics involved, 
Do they have the right institutions for that? Are they, do we need more or stronger democratic accountability at the EU level if we want to have this um, political focus that you've, been, that you've been weaving into the discussion? Um, I think we need some progress, what should I answer? But um, um, the more important question is what do we mean when we become concrete? Yeah. And, uh, and, and this is the more important question. For instance, if we discuss about the need for having a common foreign policy, the next democratic decision, it's a small one, but with a big... Uh, with big consequences that we say that should be a majority vote in the Council of the Foreign Ministers. Or if we say that we will not uh, meet the challenges of defense in Europe and this means that we have uh, a better cooperation of the defense industries and even possibly uh, that companies are going together and that we reduce the number of systems of weapons we have in Europe this is necessary, but this is something which can be just done by politics and by democracy. It's not something that happens by market occasions. So we have to understand getting this is not feasible without uh, democracy. And, that, and, and my, 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 my idea is that in many cases people that are discussing very much about e e economics, which I do also, sometimes underestimate the needs for democracy for getting the next step. And even a very conservative and in many cases reactionary guy like Bismarck knew that founding the German Reich was also only possible if he accepts that all the men older than 21 years vote with an equal vote to the national newly found national parliament. He was absolutely against parliaments, he hated democracy, and he was opposing any idea behind it, but he knew that forming Germany was not possible without that. And looking to a more progressive approach in Europe, it is not possible to solve some problems without a democratic approach, because it's not a question of lawyers, it's not a question of markets, and you need to understand at which steps it's necessary to have a way who is the one to decide it for all of us? Your extension of QMV has been duly noted, and I think uh, also your call for more democracy, even if we have to uh, become more concrete there. I would, want to uh, I would want to open the discussion to the audience now, uh, and depending on the shortness of your questions, we can take three to five questions in the first round, then we would go back to the panel. So I see Constanze Stelzenmüller there. There should be microphones somewhere. Thank you. Constanze Schelzen, the Brookings Institution. Happened to be here for a visit. Um, and this is a fascinating discussion, and I have a follow-up to you, Minister Schultz. When you say we need more democracy, I think a lot of other Europeans, and certainly Americans, would say, actually, what we need is political leadership. Be that as it may, I would like to know what you mean. I doubt that you're suggesting we have a referendum on PESCO. Are you, are you suggesting we need treaty changes for all this? Because I don't think we do. Um, or aren't you really saying we need to do more to persuade the voters of what to them seem to be incredibly technocratic subjects? Thank you very much. Michaela Schreier. Thank you. A former member of the European Commission, responsible for the small EU budget. Uh, I take up the point, the topic of uh, a stabilization mechanism uh, in case of asymmetric shocks, shocks, having in mind that it is very difficult to design it in size uh, because we have this big differences in the economies and uh, such a mechanism must be sufficient to support also not only um, uh, small countries if there is a recession but also big countries and even must be sufficient in size uh, if two big countries uh, have economic problems as it was um, uh, in France and Germany in the beginning of the um, 20th. So, 
I really wonder, Mr. Uh, Scholz, why you promote now this idea of reinsurance for unemployment schemes. This idea has been discussed in some academia, uh, but not in the political area. And there is no proposal of the Commission on the table. So what is your idea of a strategy to bring this proposal to a success in, uh, in near times? Uh, I don't see uh, this possibility, but I see the risk that it will kill other proposals to deal with the issue uh, which were tabled by the European Commission. So what is your strategy? And a question uh, to Pascal and me. You know the proposals of the European Commission uh, enshrined in the budget for a small e a euro area budget and the stabilization mechanism. I, ta I take up the words of the president of the ECB uh, that uh, an instrument must be to the task uh, in size and uh, design. So do you think that the proposals of the Commission are up to the task uh, in size and design? Thank you very much. Very good questions. Um, I see one hand in the middle. Yes, please. Could you please introduce yourself very quickly? My name is Julius. I'm studying here at the Hertie School of Governance. I have a question. President Draghi talked about the integration of the financial markets. Um, what role can fintech play in that? And why is the European blocking so many developments in the fintech and digitalization sector with not having laws and not looking at other countries like Singapore that are embracing the opportunities that are coming for cross-border banking and other things Mr. Uh, President Draghi talked about? Thank you very much. I got a sign that it's getting increasingly hot in this room. Uh, apparently, well, it's very hot up here, that I can tell you, but apparently in the back. So we'll, we'll, we'll shorten it. So what I'll do now is I'll take the full panel and then we'll come to a conclusion. And I have one question for the final round um, that I would want to shoot at you. But you have the floor now if you want to reply to the questions. Some of them were addressed specifically to Mr. Scholz, but all of you are invited to answer. So, when I discuss about democracy is an answer, I do not propose a concrete measure in the concrete steps. I think we have to understand that some questions are not solved by market ideas, but they are just solved by political decisions and they have to be reflected by the council, by the parliament, by political debate. And in some cases we need some progress, so I made the so I, I, me and the foreign minister proposed that, for instance, in the foreign minister's council, we should have a majority vote. If we discuss about European defense strategies, we have to start a debate and we have to take decisions very fast, not in some years, in the next one or two years. And this means that we change a lot of things because we will not be able to finance the defense we need in our countries if we are not making this necessary progress due to technical and economic reasons. And sometimes it's very traditional. Um, there is the basic area and it uh, has impact on how we organize ourselves. And so there had been a deep, 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 an, an attempt to form a European Defense Union some decades ago. It were missed and so we started with markets. But now I think we are back on the track and this is the next step to discuss where we can get a better integration. I think it is the industrial side where we should it, but do so, but this is something which has to be reflected politically. It is not forming a market and uh, doing it, it's uh, doing concrete decisions on that field. Um, what means the question about uh, what is, uh, what is uh, seems to be successful? So I'm quite optimistic that uh, not, it, it will not take too many time to get uh, some success for the idea of uh, a reassurance in the unemployment schemes. And I will tell you why. No, the, the academia and even the proposals that were on the table some years ago were always about forming a common system of unemployment insurance, more or less. And this is something different because this will never work to my point of view. We, so we need all the things, Pascal also worked it out about uh, the necessity of having no transfer and things like that, but why I think there could be a success. 
And with, when I discuss it with my political family, which I did today, and when I discuss it with uh, the colleagues in Europe, I see that many are thinking about this question in a way that it may happen. And possibly that the German government, with one sentence, and the finance minister of Germany with many sentences is supporting the idea is uh, a, a basis for being successful. Now on the other proposals which are discussed with very different views from all the different countries, I think we have to be more concrete to find something which could be a good solution. And this should be to my point of view that we understand that we are not searching for ways to put money with no reason to another place. So there's a lot of proposals where if you are powerful enough, you get the money with what forever what you like to have. So, so I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical, not really opposing it, but I'm a little bit skeptical, say it here in, a, in, the, in the public, about ideas of uh, supporting reforms with financial means. Which reforms? The reforms, uh, a council in Europe, a committee, like in the French Revolution or so, is deciding that this is the necessary reforms? This will never happen. So any country is defining this is a reform. This means that if I'm powerful enough and I know how to intervene in European politics, I will get the money for what I want. And this is not a good idea. So we have to find a way, and I would suggest that we, this is not the solution, but it is the way of thinking, and I would like to explain to you what I, how I'm thinking. It might be useful to understand that the problem is that we do not have pro-cyclical developments in countries that are in a cyclical crisis, which means not a transfer for any year, but for one, two, or three because this is a cyclical crisis, which means that we possibly stick to what we have as investments and in infrastructure in the European Union funded by the European Union, and that we think about the question how we avoid that in a crisis the money which the U European Union is uh, offering to the countries to develop their infrastructure is not unused because they cannot afford to manage it. And if this is the thinking we have, I think we will have more pragmatic and more economically feasibly, feasible uh, solutions than some of them that are on the table. So last sentence, I think we are working on the question, but if we discuss about, uh, about uh, fintechs, we need a regulation, yes, and we need a common European regulation that would be the use, most useful thing because having a regulation is the basis for a market. Some people think it's the, different, the opposite way, but it, it, the right thing is understanding the technologies, knowing what is necessary and form ways how to do it and to avoid arbitrage with regulation and with taxes and things like that. So there is a lot of work discussing these questions and I can assure you that in the last meetings of the finance ministers this was one of the top questions always discussed also with scientists invited. Thank you very much. I think this would bring us to another discussion if we were to talk about incentivizing reforms. We will leave it at, um, at this for the time being. There was a question to you as yeah. well. One word on two questions. On the question about what about this uh, last December Commission proposal. I think uh, uh, the President of the Commission has already answered this question in his State of the Union address when he very cleverly, uh, roughly said, uh, we have Meserberg, let's work on that. Uh, and I agree with that. There is something on the table that needs to be agreed, digested quickly. It's there. It's complex, it's been well thought, and this is urgent because we have European elections uh, next year. So the question is not whether the big schemes and whether the five presidents' report should be implemented in all paragraphs, which, by the way, sometimes contradict each other. It's because it's been done by five presidents. Uh, that's inevitable. But that's the urgent thing. So let's take what's on the table. 
and do it. And do it now, and we all know that this uh, probably necessitates a bit more uh, political energy in both Paris and Berlin than what we have for the moment, and this is why the political question is so important. One word on this uh, democracy issue. There is a democratic deficit in the European Union, but the deficit is not on the critique, it's on the demo. So we don't have a European demos today. Europeans do not feel they belong to a community which is uh, as strong as their regional or national community. This is a reality, which is why it was a stupid thing, retrospectively, to try and do a constitution. Huh? You do a cathedral for people who do not believe. So we have to go back to what we've done previously, which is chapels. We had one for European and coal community. Then we had a specific treaty for the internal market. And then we had a specific treaty to create a European Central Bank, because we needed that. So let's go back to this good old method. One thing we want to do together, if there is agreement that the existing institutional framework is not enough, let's change it, but for the purpose of what we want to do. Not for some sort of big dream that all this has to be uh, like uh, the Versailles Chateau, you know, with the nice things. This, I think, we have to go back to that. And if we go back to that, and if we go to European people, not saying we need to change the treaties because we need to change the treaties, but we need to have a European monetary fund, which we need to do, and I think everybody agrees on that. I'm convinced if you go to the people and you say we need a European monetary fund, then we need to change the treaty because that's not possible with existing. We will get it. So a call for some pragmatism and a call for urgency. I would like to conclude this panel with a last question. At the beginning, I asked you all about your worst case scenarios, and I want to um, sort of close the circle and let's assume there will be a room in five years' time. It might be equally hot. I don't hope so. We might be on stage. Maybe we are not on stage. In your ideal scenario, um, Ms. Bach, in your long-term ideal scenario, what would you say is working better now? Five years, we imagine ourselves. In five years, uh, we hopefully have come through the next downturn, um, a recession led by an overheating in the U.S., uh, and come out on the other side with a with stronger institutional framework supporting monetary union and another decisive push, um, especially on structural reforms to overcome eurosclerosis. Uh, President Draghi referred to the debates on the 19, in the 1980s, which are very similar to some extent to the debates that we have today. So um, coming through on the other side of the next downturn uh, with all the member states still on board, and with uh, sort of revived uh, momentum. That would be my best, sen best scenario. So the positive vision still has a downturn in the middle. Okay. <laughs> Pascal Ami, what in your view, which discussions do you want to have been solved in five years' time? So you don't want to hear about it anymore. Uh, I, my, my dream, given the state of the world today, is that five years from now, Europe has become strong enough for the US-China rivalry not to put this world as a mess. There is a probability that it will be the case, and what they are doing presently is not good. Either we are strong enough to try and stabilize this and be with the US and with China interlocutors that moderate this rivalry, and that's, if we don't do that, the world would be a much worse place five years from now than it is today. So part of the answer lies within Europe. Thank you very much. And the last question goes to the minister. In your ideal world, where do you want economic union to stand? And what would you say, these are the successes under your belt?
I hope that we would have succeeded with uh, forming banking and financial union, that we uh, strengthened the euro, which will be much easier next time as we think today, because uh, when the UK will have left the European Union, 85% of GDP will be produced in the euro, which have, will have an impact on the integration processes within the European Union. I'm absolutely sure about that question. And uh, we made the necessary progress in our foreign policy in, uh, and in the common defense uh, strategy. And uh, we have uh, built our European border and, uh, and uh, developed a common strategy towards migration. And in the end, I think this Europe could be strong enough to meet the challenges Pascal already met, uh, described. Uh, we have to fight, as I started uh, my first uh, address here, uh, for our sovereignty that no others are deciding about the future but ourselves. Thank you very much. And with these visions of the future of economic uh, union but also of the EU uh, writ large, and let's be very clear, it's a long way to go. So in the five years, we need to do a lot to be then able to sort of come to this ideal scenario. With these positive visions, I would like to conclude the panel and ask Arthur Rus to join us on stage. Um, Arthur Rus will wrap up the conference with some final remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your attention, dear President Draghi, dear Vice Chancellor Scholz, Excellencies and Members of Parliament. Let me start with a metaphor. It's very hot here. I see that many of you have taken off your jacket, and that is what the jacket is for. It has to be taken off when it's not needed, and it has to be taken on when it's needed. So, this is of some of these measures and some of these mechanisms and some of these preparations are there for the case that they are needed. And there might be a winter. The same is with ties. If it, is, if it is functional, use it. If it is regulation which is restricting, you take it off. You know, this is what we should do with the measures also in Europe. So why are we doing all this? Uh, when I was speaking to German politicians on what is needed to have better European policies, most of them say, we know what to do. But if they talk with the people, the people say, well, what we see in Europe is they can save banks, they can save Greece, they can save migrants, but what's in it for me? And that's a very deep question that is now, nowadays very much discussed in, in Germany also. And therefore, I think we have to somehow break this vicious circle. Because if there is no trust, if there is social frustration, there is no trust, then there will not be a mandate. If there is no mandate, there cannot be executive power. If there are not executive power, there cannot be a delivery of good economic policy. If there is no good economic policy, there cannot be the, the, the results for the people. If there are no results for the people, people are frustrated. So here we have to break the vicious circle. And I'm very happy that we heard today a lot of good proposals how to break the circle in uh, increasing the performance of the European economic policy. We need a strong Europe that can deliver to tap the potential of the markets, not only the service market, as you said, President Draghi, but also the capital market, as you said, Mrs. Barch. Second, we need a strong Europe that is our only chance to be relevant and to remain relevant. The only reason that Trump respects Juncker is that he is representing the 28 or 27. And this is, this is how we can shape our global world, by having the right, uh, right representation, and it's the only way. And then there, to remain sovereign, we need a new sense of new uh, European sovereignty. And that, that was discussed already in the panel, so I will not uh, dive uh, deep into that. But what you said about it, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Vice-Chancellor, I think it is very, very worth to be taken up. And it, it might be, in some areas, deregulation, but it might be also, in other areas, regulation. 
for the digital market, maybe we need a tie. So there is where we have to strengthen uh, the, the, the European Union and also to strengthen the European sovereignty. I want to thank you all for your ideas. What was said today by you, President Draghi, about risk sharing and risk reduction will be studied by many of these students and by politicians and by all of us because I think here this is really the clue how to connect these two to each other, risk sharing but also risk reduction, so that we indeed overcome this incentive for moral hazard. And I also like very much the idea of you, Pascal, to invite uh, Olaf Schulz and Bruno Le Maire to do the same thing as, as they did, but then on television. Yeah, in order. <laughs> well, I have to say, the idea that this is explained to a broader public is so important because then you also can, can build support for it. And maybe in such an interview, it also should be explained that the German and the Dutch, I am Dutch, language are the only languages in which the word for debt and guilt is the same. So debt automatically has a moral component. A German person cannot think about de uh, debt as a thing that has a size. It only is good if it is minimal. Now, for a moment, think about debt as if it is a shoe size. For me, it's 45. For you, it's 38. Or maybe 46. And it depends on what you want to do, on what is what is your size, what is your weight, do you want to run, do you want to do ballet or whatever. Depth should be seen as a size that fits and not as something that only a minimal is good. So maybe that could be a part of your interview. <laughs> I don't know. Your question, Katrine, and thank you by your, by your High quality moderation. I, it is not always that I hear a moderator asking this question that indeed challenge people to give what they otherwise would may have not said. Pascal is agreeing on that. <laughs> what happens if we fail the economic union to work? Maybe the experts will say, with our ideas, we would be living in a much more stable economic and financial European setup. And some experts will say, well, if it fails, I told you so, it ain't never going to work. Then second, what might European policymakers say? They're more used to fudging and deciding along the way. In German, that's heißt Aufsicht fahren. Politicians will try to put on a brave face and say, well, we are on the way, we make progress, but they will think it worked okay-ish up until now, so it will work in the future, and what can we do? Member states have their own worries and constraints, don't they? But some politicians will say, yeah, it ain't never going to work. I told you so. We need to radically change everything. But the citizens of Europe, what will they say? First of all, and my, I might have to deeply disappoint you here, they do not care citizens of Europe do not care about the experts and policy makers reaction if it will fail. They want to see what, uh, their representatives to deliver and to make it work and they want to see and feel the results. And if the citizens end up saying, told you so, it ain't never going to work. And if they vote accordingly, both in national and European elections, then all of us have failed big time because that always has to be the ultimate goal. Do we make this work for the citizens? To quote one of the greatest Europeans, Jacques Delors, the weakening becomes worsened by the widening distance between the governed and their governments. We must not forget about that. And we must remember that we can't take Europe for granted. Europe as such is a common public good that needs to be invested in. We have to keep advertising and fighting for this unique historical project. And I hear that there is some heat outside also. Making Europe sovereign in unity 
In a global world is a goal that we at Werdersmann Stiftung will continue to promote fighting and working on. And together with our partners of Jacques Delors uh, Institute Berlin, uh, Paris and the Hertie School of Governance, we will work on these issues of internal markets. We will work on shock absorption. We will work on the idea of a reinsurance employment. Uh, and we will work on how risk sharing and risk reduction could be com combined. Maybe there it would be very important not only to see it from a French approach like solidarity, but also from a general European approach of solidity, because it is in the combination of solidity and solidarity here that might do the trick. I have been in that discussion for the last 15 years, because in the time I was a Minister of uh, Social Affairs and Employment, and we had the presidency of the European uh, Council, that was the first time these ideas were brought to the table. And they were declined, exactly because what you said, and I, first I was in favor of the idea. And then I thought it might not going, going to work because it does not respect the different, the different economies, and it would, it would kill the chances for people to come back in the labor market of Portugal and of other, of other countries. So I think very much that this should be seen as something like a, uh, ironing out the, the turbulences and therefore a shock absorption mechanism and why, where can it better be related to than to the unemployment figures? Because then there are uh, expenses to be, to be paid that are not necessarily uh, helping for uh, coming in a better economic situation. With this plea, I want to conclude the event. I thank everybody who made this conference happen. It was a very small team, but highly effective. And I want to thank all the members of the team who made this conference work. was a rather long applause. Well served. I thank all the coordinating, co-organizing institutions in this endeavor, the Hardy School of Governance, the Delors Institutes in Berlin and Paris, in particular my long-standing friend Hendrik Enderlein, but uh, all of them, all of these institutes. I thank the distinguished speakers for their time, their ideas, their honesty. We are very proud and honored that you came to us here in Berlin today. And maybe, yes, maybe we should do something like this also in Paris. And thank you, the audience, both in this room and those following the event on the live stream, for your interest, your listening, your questioning. I hope we will see many of you again on this road to advance the European project. Thank you very much. Vielen Dank.